Good morning, brothers and sisters. Our reading this morning, uh, we continue in Acts, Acts chapter 28, the very end of the book, and we read from verse 1 through to the end of 16. Acts 28. 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, though he has, a, he has escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighbourhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Pub Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honoured us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. Okay, we're on some battery issues, sorry about that. Uh, I think if you, if you think about it, it's really quite obvious that there were no children involved in Paul's journey to Rome, because if there had have been, the narrative would have been interspersed with interjections of, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And maybe even you here, you've been asking that question, oh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's been a long journey a journey which really started back in uh, Acts chapter 1. So keep a finger in, in chapter 28 and then flick back to Acts chapter 1. And we see that in chapter 1 verse 8 is the first time we get this idea that the gospel is going to make it all the way to Rome. Jesus says to his disciples, he makes a promise, it's a general prom promise here, uh, we get specific promises as we go that it will be uh, Rome itself, but he says, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So here we are, it's taken 27 and a half chapters, it's taken 50 sermons this is the 51st sermon in our series on Acts, uh, which started 21 months ago. And now, finally, we are there. 
And so keep your finger in, in chapter 1, but if you fl- flick back to uh, chapter 28, you see at the end of verse 14, And so we came to Rome. And praise the Lord and a thousand hallelujahs and everybody celebrates. Now, let's ask a question, why? Why is Paul, and really the Gospel, now in Rome? Well, you could answer, well, because Paul was uh, fed up with the uh, plotting of the Jews and they they wouldn't cease, and so eventually he said, well, okay, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. That's one reason why he's there. Uh, There's another reason, though, of course, and that is because God promised it would happen. And because God promised it would happen, therefore it's there. God keeps His Word. Uh, We've seen that throughout. God told Paul that the ship would run aground, and it did. God said to Paul, uh, not one person on board will lose their life, and they didn't. God said to Paul, you will be, you you will get to Rome and he did. But even still, we ask the question, well, why? Why was that God's promise for Paul to get to Rome? And I think the ultimate reason is because the news about Jesus is too big to be for Jerusalem only, or Judea, or even Samaria. Because of who Jesus is, Uh, containing him to Jerusalem is not good enough, not nearly enough. What is fitting for who Jesus is, is that the news of him goes out to the ends of the earth. Uh, Extraordinary goal, uh, because it's an extraordinary message. And the book of Acts, as we've seen, is how it gets from here to here. And as we've worked our way through Acts, we've seen that Uh, The gospel of Jesus, the message about Jesus or the news of Jesus uh, can't be contained, it can't be silenced and it can't be squashed. And the whole thing keeps growing and spreading, uh, sometimes despite the best efforts of of its enemies. And even sometimes the best efforts of the enemies uh, uh, result in the spreading of it even more, we've seen. It grows from a few people in Jerusalem to thousands of people in the region, to millions of people all over the world. Acts tells the story of the unstoppable force spreading over the globe. And if you're a Christian here today and you don't live in Jerusalem, then you're proof of the work of Jesus. And at the end of the day, that's what, the, that's what Acts is about. It's about the work of Jesus. So go back to chapter 1. Uh, that you've, hopefully you've still got one finger in and you can just turn back, but keep one finger in chapter 28 too, if that's not too late. Have a look right at the very first verse of the book. We see there Luke is writing and he says uh, in the first book, talking about the Gospel of Luke, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And that word began is quite significant. So if you think about it, think about all the other uh, religious leaders that have ever been. From whatever age, in whatever place, and for whatever duration, all their ministries have at some point been brought to the conclusion by their death. (laughs) They died. And that was it. The work finished. They don't do anything for anyone for anything. And John Stott makes the point here, of Jesus alone, may it be joyfully affirmed that his ministry actively continues beyond his death and will do so until the end of the age, thus setting Christianity apart from all other religions. Uh, These other uh, religions regard their founder as having completed his ministry during his lifetime. Luke says, Jesus only began his. There's there's, there's no one like Jesus. 
And um, if you think back 50 sermons ago, and I, I was the first one to preach on this series, so if things have gone wrong, you can blame me, I suppose. Uh, but I urged us in that very first sermon in this series to take a pen and in your Bibles cross out uh, the, the title of the book, Acts of the Apostles, cross out Apostles and write the word Jesus instead, so it reads the Acts of Jesus. Now, you've had a lot of time to do that. Has anybody done that yet? Okay, well, we're not quite there. It's, it's about Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus who sends the Holy Spirit to energise and direct the apostles to witness about Him. It's Jesus who provides the supernatural power to perform miracles as evidence uh, to what they're saying about Jesus. It's Jesus who is the content and focus of the message at every point. Jesus is the one calling the shots. He's the one running the show. He's the one who's got them to where they are in His timing uh, to fulfil His plans and purposes to magnify His name. And so it's really quite ironic, so go back to chapter 28 now, that we see uh, the ship <laughs> that finally sort of brings them here to Italy, uh, a ship of Alexandria, verse 11 in chapter 28, with the twin gods as a figurehead. <laughs> I, I just wonder if Luke actually included that as a bit of a joke for us. And you might have um, a footnote in your Bible at that point stating uh, that is the Greek gods Castor, Castor and Pollux. They were the mythical twin sons of Zeus who uh, was said to be the protectors of those who sail upon the seas. And I think it is a bit of a, a joke here. I mean, these pagan deities leading the way as if they've got anything to do with anything that's been happening. Uh, and if you've been reading the story since the beginning, you know, it is a joke. You think, well, which God is in charge here? <laughs> is it these twin gods at the front of the ship or is it Jesus? And, you know, of course it's Jesus. Which God is in charge indeed? Now, we might think the answer is obvious, but uh, let me tell you, it's a question which is not a bad question to keep asking ourselves. And that question, uh, who's in charge, <laughs> maybe it's a question that's been on our minds this week, um, as it's been referenced a couple of times in our service already to the uh, US election, who's in charge there. Uh, let me read what Russell Moore wrote just a couple of days ago. Uh, Russell Moore is one of the key players in the Southern Baptist Convention. He said, Even when we don't know who will sit behind the resolute desk in January, we know who stands in heaven and will one day join heaven and earth together under his rule and it will not be a close call. <laughs> the triumphant Jesus is not vulnerable to the upheaval of nations or cultures. And we've seen that. The triumphant Jesus is not vulnerable to venomous snakes or treacherous storms or plotting Jews or rioting mobs. But why not? Because he's in charge of them all. <laughs> he's in charge of all of them. Uh, what, what we might think is the, the good things and also the bad things. They're all, in the end, just servants of the Lord Jesus. And so no problem for Paul and uh, others who were with him to hop on board this, sh this idolatrous ship, <laughs> which has the twin gods on, on the front, and, and use it uh, and be thankful for it. Paul needs to get to Rome. This Alexandrian ship is going to Rome. Castor sugar and bollocks are up front, but God rules the waves. <laughs> and so off they go. Uh, there are quite a number of ferries in the Philippines uh, we, that we've travelled on, the, the team from Australia that goes there, and uh, before the ferry heads off, there are prayers offered to Mary. And so I'll come across on the PA and uh, the picture of Mary will be up on the screen. And, um, you know, don't worry about the fact that, as uh, John mentioned a couple of weeks ago, 200 passages, 100 life jackets. 
Uh, we've had our prayers to Mary, so everything is going to be all right. Well, what do we do? As Christians who are on the ship, what are we going to do in that case? Just maybe close our eyes and lock our ears and hope that we don't get affected somehow by this, by this idolatry? Pretend like nothing's happening? Just go up the other end of the ferry and, and ignore it? Well, we certainly don't join in with the prayers, of course, and say amen. <laughs> and we certainly, certainly don't worry that something bad is going to happen because we're not... No, we remember, uh, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, an idol is nothing. And there is but one God. And so we use the opportunity to springboard into a conversation about Jesus let me tell you about who God says is really in charge. That's what we do. That's what I wish <laughs> I could say we do. Now, I've been on those ferries, I don't know how many times, when, that, when this has happened a dozen, 20 times or something, and I can remember one time where I've used the opportunity to speak about Jesus, to my shame, only once. And maybe I've got to think about here, what, what would Paul have done on this ship, do you think? He's on the ship. What would he have said? And we're reading between the lines a fair bit here, but the preacher's allowed to do that from time to time. Uh, maybe he might have said, you know, hey, what about your figurehead uh, made from the twin gods? Oh, yes, says the sailor. They're fantastic. Once you have them up the front of your ship, no problem. You can go anywhere through any storm. Oh, wow, says Paul. Uh, I wish I had them on my last ship because that thing got really busted up. In fact, if you look back over there, you can still see it. Uh, the, the stern all smashed up there, shredded to pieces. And then maybe Paul would have used the opportunity for an Acts 17 moment where he would have said, look, I'm intrigued that you would put these things up the front of your ship. And I perceive that uh, in every way you're very religious. Well, do you want to know something? The God who made the world and the sea and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, cannot be constrained and contained up on a masthead like that. And I'd love to tell you about the living God who orders the winds and the waves and, in fact, everything. And you can imagine uh, Luke says to Paul, you know, why don't you tell him about the time when I don't know, any, any number of occasions that we've been through. We've had, this is, we've had 50 sermons. You, you could pick one, I suppose. <laughs> which, which example would you pick of evidence of the, the sovereignty of God over all things here? You know, tell them about the time when you're in jail in Philippi, where the very person that the Jews had put in place to guard you, to stop you from preaching the gospel... Uh, the jailer, gets converted, <laughs> he and his whole family. Tell them about that time. I mean, how many times has the situation been that it seems like Paul is right where his enemies want him, only to turn out he's right where Jesus wants him to be? Tell them about the time when God used uh, the, the plots of the Jews and he used your nephew, Paul, and, and the surprising kindness of a centurion to get you to Rome. <laughs> Unexpected means to make clear uh, which God is in charge or Jesus is in charge. Extraordinary goal, uh, extraordinary message, and at times, extraordinary means. But do you know what? A lot of the time, it was just very ordinary means that God uses. Uh, you might say good doctrine goes a long way, and that's true. Sound doctrine goes a long way. It was uh, this first-hand knowledge of the complete sovereignty of God over all things that enabled Paul to continue in the midst of some really trying situations. I'm sure when he put his head down on the pillow at night, he could rest uh, in the sovereignty of Jesus over all things. So, if 
you know, that's true and that's good. But there's, a, there's more to the story than that. Uh, good doctrine, as it were, as it, as it is, um, has a twin that goes on the front of the ship to help us through the storms. And what we also see here is that God uses the very ordinary means of Christian fellowship. And I don't think Luke paints Paul as this hardened man who's unaffected by anything that's gone on in his past and unperturbed by anything that he might face in the future. Uh, he's, a, he's a man of resolve, yep, sure. But no doubt, by the time Paul reached Rome, he was just, he, he, of course, he, he would just be f- absolutely physically and emotionally exhausted from what's happened. In addition to that, there would have been concern over what was actually going to happen. Now he is in Rome and he's got to uh, appear and appeal before Caesar. What's going to happen there? And so there's something quite significant in this final leg as Paul disembarks the ship and starts to make about the 150 kilometre walk to Rome itself. The wonderful thing was they were about to meet the brothers. Uh, Paul certainly doesn't receive any encouragement from the, the twin brothers on the front of the ship, <laughs> of course, but he does from the brothers in the faith. Look at verse 14 here. There we found brothers, uh, I mean, Christian brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days. In other words, they had a preoccupation with Christian fellowship. And how they managed to arrange all of this, we're not told. But what we are told is that they seized the opportunity for Christian fellowship. Uh, After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Putioli, and there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for a week. And they're even more generous than uh, Publius is from Malta in verse 7, who entertained them for three days and then had to move on. We see the gathering of God's people is a priority for them. You see again in verse 15, and the brothers there, uh, that is some of the Christians who were in Rome, uh, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. Uh, There were Christians there in Rome, uh, they've heard that Paul has now landed in Italy and they say to each other, let's go and meet him halfway and so they, they go down to the, uh, the Forum of Appius, which is about 70 kilometres uh, from Rome. And apparently, some of them only got halfway to that halfway point, and they got to the Three Taverns, which was about 35 kilometres out of Rome, and sort of looked around and thought, oh, actually, I think this might be a pretty good place to, just, uh, to wait for Paul. You, you carry on, and we'll just stay here for a couple of days, and um, we'll meet him <laughs> when he gets here. And the word meet is an important word here. It's a technical word, and there are different words for meet, but this one's quite peculiar. It's a meeting that has to do with going out to celebrate a dignitary which comes, uh, who is coming to your city. And so, for example, in, uh, Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 25 of a bridegroom who's coming to receive his bride and the wedding party goes out to meet him same word. We're in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, we're told that Jesus Christ is coming to claim the world as his city, to create a new Jerusalem. He comes with all his uh, royal dignity and power and what do we do? We go up to meet him. Uh, The same way you would do if a dignitary was coming to town, the citizens of their town show their respect by going out to meet them. And as you see a similar thing on uh, Palm Sunday, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and the children go out to meet the dignitary and celebrate with him. And that's what they did with Paul. And what's Paul's reaction? Well, Paul's reaction is not, well, (laughs) excuse me, do you know who I am? I have a very important mission to accomplish. I'm a very important man. I don't have time for this. Uh, Just get out of my way, uh, please and let me get on with my way. Uh, that's not what he says. He doesn't say, look, I don't, I don't need this, I'm a rock. 
I'm the Apostle Paul, I'm an island. I have my books and my doctrine to protect me. I am shielded in my armour, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. That's, that's not the Apostle Paul. It's a different Paul, in fact. Uh, what we see here is the Apostle Paul, that if, um, if you're still in Acts 28, just turn the page over to Romans chapter 1. And this is what Paul has written three years earlier, before he gets to this point. And he's, he's writing to these people that he's meeting now. And this is what he said, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you. There's a, there's a great longing and passion from Paul. That I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Okay, we get that. We, we anticipate that Paul would be able to offer them something. But there's more than that. Verse 12, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. You see, Paul is not a loner here. He knows the importance of Christian fellowship. It's this precious time that Paul has with the believers here that God uses to keep him going. And the result, in, at the end of verse 15, on seeing them, Paul does two things. He thanked God and took courage. And if that's true and necessary for Paul, how much more so for us then? I think if, if we had asked Paul and Luke and Aristarchus, you know, so what did you think of the, of the Bay of Naples? <laughs> what do you think about the harbour in Puteoli? I think they'd probably say, mm, well, you know, I don't really have much recollection about that. <laughs> well, if we said to them, you know, what about the three volcanoes you passed on the way into the harbour? You can research that later. Uh, three volcanoes there, one of them doesn't erupt until AD 79, uh, but they pass them. He'd say, uh, you know what? I'd have to think about it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I'll never forget. I'll never forget the seven days we, we spent with the believers there. I'll never forget those who came out to meet us. They were rich, and Julius the Centurion allowed us the wonderful privilege. <laughs> Why was it like that for them? Well, it wasn't because they shared a human friendship, because they didn't even know each other yet. It wasn't because they had a natural affection. How, how could it be? It wasn't because they barracked for the same sporting team, it wasn't because they had shared concerns about the nature of Roman society. It was because of the supernatural wonder of being in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom there is no barrier of ethnicity or education or finance or age or whatever else it might be. There is the reality and the priority and the, the preciousness of Christian fellowship. And I suppose it, it just comes down to our perspective. So if your perspective is, uh, if belonging to Jesus means belonging to his family, then, then the gathering of physically gathered together takes on a whole new meaning. If it's not your perspective, then the gathering of, of God's people in a big group or a small group at any time of day or night you know, might be done just out of a, out of a reluctant sense of duty, uh, maybe done for, for legalistic reasons. I can just tick that off to say, yep, I've done the right thing and now I'm off to my next appointment. Well, what's your perspective when it comes to this? Yep, of course... We need sound doctrine. Uh, that's the starting point. That's fundamental. A big Jesus who sits on the throne and rules everything. But if that was all, then you may as well just stay home and watch the live stream. 
Why bother with this then? With this, what we're doing now? And you'll know, yep, we've been really grateful that we've been able to do the live stream when we've had to and continue doing it for those who can't be here. Um, but you'll know that's really a very far second best. And you'll know that we've uh, been thinking some time ago about having three church services so we can all be t- together in some capacity uh, on a Sunday and we're thankful we didn't have to do that because now we can, we can cover ourselves over too. But even now, having morning and afternoon, that's not what we think is best. Let me quote from uh, Mark Dever and then we're, there, then we're almost finished. <laughs> you probably, are we there yet? <laughs> are we nearly there? He said, Ex- except for the rarest of circumstances, a true Christian builds his life into the lives of other believers through the concrete fellowship of a local church. He knows he has not yet arrived. He's still fallen and needs the accountability and instruction of that local body of people called the church, and they need him. As we gather to worship God and exercise love and good deeds toward one another, we demonstrate in real life, you might say, the fact that God has reconciled us to himself and to one another. We demonstrate to the world that we have been changed, not primarily because we memorise Bible verses, pray before meals, tire the portion of our income and listen to Christian radio stations, but because we increasingly show a willingness to put up with, to forgive and even to love a bunch of fellow sinners. You and I cannot demonstrate love or joy or peace or patience or kindness sitting all by ourselves on an island. No, we demonstrate it when the people we have committed to loving give us good reasons not to love them, but we do it anyway. If we are physically uh, able to meet together as God's people under his word, but uh, choose not to seek out the companionship of others who love Jesus, well, maybe it's because our affections for Jesus are cooling, cooling off. So Luke's not talking about the geography here. I mean, he mentions different places, but he's not sort of... um, extolling and, un- and unfolding the, the panorama that's around him. He says, you know what? When you boil it all down, it was the encouragement from the brothers that kept us going. I don't know, some, some of you here, maybe, maybe most of us here, can testify to the, uh, to the priority and, and the reality of Christian fellowship. Some of us here in our congregation for whom the companionship of, of, of this very moment, uh, together with the instruction from the Bible, uh, the greeting that, that they have received or are about to receive from you, is not something that they can take or leave. It's breath to them, it's life to them. For them, uh, Christian fellowship is a priority because in Christ it has become a reality. See, when someone's going through uh, a tough time, yeah, perhaps they need to be reminded of the fact that Jesus is in charge and God keeps his word. Of course, that's fundamental. We all need uh, to know about that. But maybe what they also need is for someone just to be there. And I say this not to make us feel, yeah, look, I really wish someone was there for me. Uh, But to ask, is there someone who you need to be there with? And also, just to remember the preciousness of what we have here and what we're doing right now and not give up on it. When Paul met with these uh, fellow Christians no doubt the wonderful stories of God's grace that were shared and such was the encouragement that um, after this Paul went straight to the synagogue and proclaimed Jesus as the only Messiah and as the fulfillment of every promise in the Old Testament and the king uh, in God's kingdom but that's what we'll look at next week and so I'll leave it for then.
Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, draw our hearts increasingly to Jesus and to each other, we ask, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.